Approaching the history of Roman civilization, one can't help but feel daunted, intimidated by the gargantuan task ahead, confronted with 2,000 years of history, ostensibly, from the founding of the city by Romulus until the fall of Constantinople in 1453. History, a history of events, is a process of understanding human action. Therefore, history is the study of change, it is the study of transformation, it is the study of becoming. Therefore, when looking at 2,000 years of Roman history, how can one possibly grapple with the subject when one is confronted with such monumental changes, transformations, contradictions, hence the necessity of periodization? Those approaching history for the first time may be confronted by periods such as the Roman Republic, the Roman Empire, often demarcated by a series of dates. But when one goes deeper into history, one understands that such demarcation is contentious. There is an aspect of historical invention because all of history has to be construed in a way where it could be intelligible both to the historian and the reader. And Roman history is probably the most controversial of all subjects in trying to demarcate these various epochs of change. I do mean epoch in its most literal sense here. So how am I approaching this topic? This video is not going to be a historiographical video. However, I'm of course conscious of the historiography when approaching this topic. Rather, I am bringing my own perspective in terms of trying to demarcate various times in Roman history and bring everyone through my thought process as to arrive at certain concepts of errors, successive errors, and the idea of history as the study of change. So it may come as a surprise when one looks at the history of the Kingdom of Rome and then the Republic of Rome and look at dates, say for example, as 509 BC or 24 BC and how I'm going to be throwing out many of these dates and trying to walk you through a recontextualized sense of periods and sub-periods. Indeed, this is a very daunting task, and I hope my explanation here will be sufficient to carry you through it. First, when one approaches Roman history, you have to demarcate between written history, history that could be quantified in some way, and legendary history. You can look at the period before 600 BC as the legendary period of Rome. Of course, here you have the four first legendary kings of Rome, beginning with Romulus. But even before then, when looking at Virgil's Aeneid, you can go back to the foundations of the kingdom of Alba Longa by Aeneas, and further back to the ostensibly Trojan heritage and the descent of the line of Caesars through Venus Genetrix. So my first attempt to periodize Roman history rather than Roman legend may come as controversial in the fact that I do not look at the kingdom of Rome as a contained historical period. Rather, I look at this as a period of early Rome from roughly around the year 600, when you have the first Etruscan dynasty in Rome, up until around the year 338. Now, why have I chosen this demarcation point? This period in Roman history, Rome is very much a city-state, but it is also undergoing sweeping changes, trying to qualify an identity which is going to carry Rome through through the next centuries, indeed millennia. Looking beyond the mythic history, the Roman city-state around the year 600 BC lacks a clear identity. To the north, 
there are the Etrurians, the Etruscans, who have a definite civilization which has eclipsed the small city-state of Rome. Indeed, the Roman monarchy has become tainted in further Roman historiography by the association, indeed the idea of subordination to the Etruscans in the literal sense of having an Etruscan dynasty rule over Rome and therefore the association with kings as tyrants which is emblemized with Tarquin's rape of Lucrezia. Things aren't any better if you look to the south, to Capua, to Sicily, to southern Italy, the realm of Magna Graecia, which literally means Greater Greece, and there we have the Greek colonia, which had been established along with Etruscan civilization around the 8th century BC. So the process of this period of early Rome in these three centuries, from the 7th century up into the 4th century, is not only a process of creating a political identity for Rome, removing the Etruscan kings and attempting to find a power balance between the various factions of the city, but it is also a progress towards Roman sovereignty, Rome as a power. A similar instance that you see in many Greek cities. However, with Rome, after the year 400, it is very clear that Rome is going to not only become a hegemon of the Italian city-states, but Rome is going to completely redefine into a Roman Italic identity in a way that no Greek city-state ever could, not even Sparta and the Peloponnese League or Athens. So, and the Delian League. So what do I mean by this period of transformation? Well, after the kings are deposed, it is not a simple case of Rome having an identifiable republic. Rather, we have various orders who have replaced the system of monarchy. The senators, the patrician orders representing the Roman aristocracy, the equestrian class representing the knights, and the plebs representing the um, common citizenry. Over the next 300 years, we have a conflict between all these various powers, and it's only towards the end of the 4th century that terms such as, say for example, the office of consul um, become constant and recognisable going forward into the few centuries. This is a period of the conflict of orders. Titles such as consul, which is supposedly an equivalent of stratigos, which in Greek means general, is replaced by consular tribunes. And Rome is also simply one of many cities in the region of Latium as part of the Latin League. However, by the year 338, the year 340, Rome has established an ascendancy among the states of Latium. Rome has now begun to define itself by the institutions which are going to carry it forward. And Rome embarks on a series of wars with its neighbours, which begin the period of the consolidation of Italy. So moving on from the consolidation of a Roman homeland in Latium, Rome becoming almost synonymous with the Latins, Rome then embarks upon a rather rapid period of expansion, when one considers that Rome had simply been a city-state lodged between the powerful Greek colonies in the south and the Etruscan civilization in the north. So Rome, by the end of the 4th century, Roman, the Roman sense as a republic, has become identifiable as a growing regional power in the Mediterranean. Hence why I believe there's some validity when looking at history as the process of becoming, the history of events, the process of transformation, that one looks at the deposition of the Etruscan kings, the Etruscan period and arriving at a Roman civilization, 600 until around the year 330, as a useful process of demarcation, perhaps more useful than cutting the Roman Republic around the year 509 and ignoring the, you can say, the insignificance of Rome during much of the 5th and 4th centuries BC. The first period of the Roman Republic 
Indeed, you can really define this by two periods, in my view. One lasting from the beginning of the Samnite Wars in the 340s and ending with the destruction of Corinth and the devastation of Carthage around the same time between um, 150 until 146. The period between 340 and uh, 146 is a period of rapid expansion in all directions. Rome, having defeated the Samnites, gets involved in the Pyrrhic Wars against the Epirot king from Greece, and Rome establishes power over Magna Graecia. Rome is then confronted by the most powerful maritime empire in the world at that time, the Phoenician Carthaginian Empire from North Africa. In a huge shock to the Mediterranean world order, Rome, which began the First Punic War without a navy, is able to defeat Carthage and shortly after annex sizable quantities of Sicily and Sardinia. So from a regional power contained within Italy, Rome has quickly embarked on a stage of becoming a hegemon of Italy, albeit allied with various city-states, and then has embarked upon the process of empire, yet whilst retaining core aspects of the republican identity, that being a power-sharing agreement between the orders, the equestrian, the senatorial, and the plebeian orders, hence why the official name of Rome is the Senate and People of Rome, as an entity, as a res publica, in the literal sense of meaning a public affair, rather than the domain of a single king or tyrant, or indeed a more confined elite, such as the various oligarchies in Greece. The core to this also is the idea of Roman citizenship, the idea that the soldier is a landowner, and the idea that the Roman army is by extension a militia. Rome doesn't have a large professional army, and it doesn't rely on mercenaries to the same degree that the Carthaginian Empire would. So you can say that the Punic Wars, especially the First Punic War, is a clash of civilizations, a clash of different political and social systems, and the Roman system comes out as superior. And this is confirmed with the Second Punic War, when by all accounts, Rome as a civilization should have ended after the battle, the first few battles of that war, when Hannibal crosses the Alps and then inflicts the horrific loss to the Romans, the Battle of Cannae. It is only the endurance of these institutions and the will of the Roman militia classes to deal with losses in the tens of thousands and again take the fight to a civilization and empire which again relies on mercenary power albeit headed by the military genius that was Hannibal thereby allowing Rome to turn the tide and win the Second Punic War. In a similar instance, with the collapse of the Greek empires, the empires of the Diadochi in the east, Rome is able to expand its sphere of influence into Greece. And when looking at um, figures such as Polybius, Roman civilization meeting Greek civilization, Rome already has a huge amount of cultural indebtedness to Greek civilization. Already, Greek institutions have impacted the Etruscans, and of course, there is the direct proximity between the Greek colonies and the city of Rome itself. And at the beginning, there seems to be a attempt at Roman protectorship, Roman protectorship of the Greek liberty in this period. However, with the Third Punic War, with the destruction of Carthage, and with the destruction of Corinth, all of a sudden the bedrock of Rome, the Roman identity, the management between the Senate and people, has been overridden by a very wealthy and powerful patrician elite who are dependent on tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of slaves which have been brought in by this conquest. So the augmenting of Roman territory 
and the flooding of Italic territory by slaves has fundamentally redefined the relationship between the plebeian orders and the senatorial aristocracy. Combined to that, as if things couldn't get worse, after an attempt to halt this process with the, agrar the agrarian reforms of the Brothers Gracchus, we have the Cimbrian Wars, which in terms of the scale of loss rival, if not supersede that of the losses inflicted um, on the Romans by the Carthaginians. And this, if anything, hastens the end of the Republic because we move from the process of the militia armies to professional armies who owe more allegiance to their local commanders rather than an identity of Rome itself. And indeed, with the social wars in the the period of uh, the, the 90s and 80s, there is an attempt also to expand the scope of what it means to be Roman to encompass many of the Italian city-states. So Rome starting as a hegemonic power with, you, you can say, a rather provincial character. In terms of the transformation to an empire, the city is essentially losing its status to the growing power of the peripheral territories and the various powerful generals who are arising out of them and embarking on new conquests. Rome in the late Republic, following the Third Punic Wars and the sack of Corinth, is a Rome in a constant state of civil strife, and yet it is also expanding rapidly, with the defeat of the Seleucids, the defeat of the Macedonians, the defeat of Ephrodates, the Romans are expanding from their original base in Italy into Anatolia. They have established lordship over Greece, North Africa, Spain, and when Caesar come al comes along, we see Rome expanding into Gaul up until the uh, what is now the English Channel and even making an expedition into Germania and into Britannia. So Rome is expanding and yet Rome is collapsing. There have been many attempts in this period to arrest the process of decline for the Roman Empire. One such attempt is by Sulla, the dictator who attempts a top-down series of reforms based on establishing cohorts loyal to the Republican identity while eliminating and seizing the territory of anyone who was considered hostile to the Republic and really hostile to Sulla's reforms. And then there is a next process of this attempt to stymie these forces of disintegration in the Republic with the Catiline conspiracy and Cicero's preemptive attempts to thwart, supposedly, a establishment of a new Roman dictatorship. But all of these attempts are fruitless when one looks at the rapid ascent of Julius Caesar and the first triumvirate. Within 10 years, Caesar, defying the authority of the Roman Senate, has established a Roman power base in Gaul, essentially by his own military genius, and as I mentioned, expands into Britain and expands into Germania. So how does one therefore demarcate this period in Roman history? Well, as the first period in Roman history was very much a consolidation of the identity of Rome, the second period, which is the first Republican period, was a period of expansion. The third period is still a period of expansion, but it is also a period of internal disintegration. This period of internal disintegration accelerates with Caesar. He's only in power as perpetual dictator for five years, ironically. And then we have the wars against the assassins of Caesar, led by his adopted son Octavian and Mark Antony. And then we have another triumvirate, another wars between the triumvirate, principally between Octavian and Mark Antony. With the defeat of Mark Antony, Octavian, now Augustus, the Grand nephew and the adopted heir of Julius Caesar is able to win for himself a culmination of Roman titles and create the Roman principate. Principate meaning the first citizen, the first citizenry of Rome. The office of dictator had existed beforehand, but 
in some way had become stymied by the association with Caesar's perpetual dictatorship and the odes to the original Etruscan kingship and the associations with tyranny. So Augustus, in creating the Principate, is trying to emphasise Rome's distinctly republican character. So in one sense, the Roman Republic has been saved. The Roman Republic has been consolidated. And under the reign of Augustus, the Roman Empire will expand even further. But for all intents and purposes, the res publica, the power-sharing agreement between the estates, has been superseded by an autocratic government paying lip service to the idea of the Roman institutions. Hence, we arrive at the fourth point of demarcation, which is that of the Principate. But that is, again, like these many previous periods, not to say that the Principate is that straightforward in simply looking at this as the autocratic rule of the Caesars. This period also goes through many periods of transformation. In the first hundred years, the office of Princeps, later in Parator, which literally means to have command in the Roman Empire, in association with various other titles, which simply become synonymous with Caesar, is held by one family, the descendants of the first Empress Livia and the first Emperor Augustus, the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Albeit primogeniture is never established within the Roman Empire, it is clear that one has to be of that dynasty in order to have any claim on the emperorship. So Augustus is succeeded by his son-in-law, the son of Livia, who is in turn succeeded by his grandnephew, Caligula, and then by his uncle Claudius, and then by his own grandnephew Nero, etc., etc. So even though Rome is ostensibly holding true to this idea of outward republican rule, Rome is instead consolidating itself under a dynasty, and moreover a dynasty which claims divine descent, as Caesar claimed descent from Venus, Venus Genetrix, the mother goddess of the Roman imperial dynasty, the idea of the imperial cult. When the emperor dies, the emperor attains divinity. He is deified by the Senate, as indeed Julius Caesar was. So having simultaneously retained the republican institutions and exalted the emperors, when Nero committed suicide in the year 68, Rome is facing a crisis in which it is debatable as to whether the Principate can even survive. And yet it does survive after a period of four emperors in the single year of, the 69, of 69 AD, when Vespasian is able to establish a new dynasty, despite not being of the senatorial class himself, despite being an equestrian. He is able to establish Rome's second dynasty, which has three emperors, himself, his son Titus, very briefly, and his second son Domitian. After this period also fails, Rome then embarks upon another experiment in the Principate, which is that of the system of adopted succession, or what Edward Gibbon would refer to as the period of five emperors. Neva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, and Marcus Aurelius. So even if one looks at the Principate as a blanket period, Politically, there is significant transformation going on, yet what defines the Principate in stark contrast to the later period of the, Pro the Republic, which is a period of disintegration, political and social disintegration, and the later period is that this is the period of Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Rome has expanded outwards, under Claudius, Rome will conquer Britain. Under Trajan, Rome will conquer Dacia and temporarily hold territories in Mesopotamia, the heartlands of the Parthian and later Sasanian empires. So it is appropriate to say that this could be considered a Roman golden age, and yet Rome has moved so beyond its original foundation as that of a city-state and that of the res publica, the sharing of power act between all of these various institutions, which was resolved after the conflict of orders, only to be brought back by a vengeance with the culmination of the Punic Wars, the Macedonian Wars and the wars in Greece. So how useful is the designation of a principate 
it is useful primarily as associating with the Pax Romana. One can almost say that the Pax Romana is a far more distinctive period than that of the Principate. And so I would emphasize that from the ascension of Augustus to the demise of Commodus and later the uh, demise of the Severan dynasty under Septimus Severus and his heirs, that this period, the Pax Romana, really should supersede the idea of the Principate, because the Principate will go on for another 50 years, but this period, again, one can refer to it as the later Principate or whatever, stands in stark contrast to the earlier period in that it is a process, a period of disillusion, and it is a period of transformation. Not only do we see a quick succession of coups, invasions by Goths, etc., by the Sasanians, captured emperors, murdered emperors, but we even see the brief partition of the empire between the Gallic empires, the Roman Empire proper, and the Palmyrene Empire. It is only by the glorious military campaigns of the Emperor Aurelian that an empire is even able to survive this, reintegrate these secessionist territories, and provide something for the empire to sustain itself into the future. Yet it is clear that even with the success of Aurelian and his quick assassination afterwards, that the Roman Empire, as envisaged by Augustus, is long dead. The notion of Roman citizenship the attempts of which to expand it from the city and its colonies to becoming an italic citizenship to eventually encompassing all or various parts of the entire Roman Empire. Caracalla issues a blanket expansion of the idea of Roman citizenship in a rather cynical manoeuvre, but that in itself is seismic in terms of redefining what it is to be a Roman, moving beyond these ideas of the original political situation which arrives out of the period of transformation in the 4th century BC. And we're also looking at concepts such as Romanitas, the idea of loyalty, the idea of piety, devotion, adherence to the old Roman polytheistic gods. All of these notions are being challenged, overturned, undermined in the period of the crisis of the third century, which is a very useful demarcator of the period. Because, among other things, we are seeing the arrival of the barracks emperors, the fact that Rome is essentially a military dictatorship, and a very unstable military dictatorship as that, echoing the parallels with the later Roman Republic. But Roman identity itself is being questioned. We see the advance of Christianity really since the uh, second century onwards, um, even though, of course, it had begun throughout the entire period of AD. Even Aurelian had begun the accelerated process towards monotheism with his elevation of Sol Invictus, the unconquered son, as the sole deity of the Roman Empire. Emperor Decius had attempted to bring back the traditional orders of the Roman Empire and the Decian, uh, Decianic persecutions, but this was cut short when he and his son were killed on the field of battle facing the Goths. So there is a consciousness that Rome is losing its identity, a notion of Romanitas, what it means to be Rome, Roman, is ebbing away during this period, and it's going to take a radical redefinition of what it means to be Roman in order for the territory of the empire to survive, even if that means super having the empire supersede the primacy of the city of Rome itself. And this is when we arrive at the Emperor Diocletian at a fundamental demarcation point, because Diocletian eschews any strict affiliation with the Roman Republic. He declares himself, still in the pagan tradition, of being Dominus et Deus, master and god. The population of the empire are slaves to the emperor, and the emperor himself is aided by various clients who are going to be on the front lines with the various armies fighting off barbarian incursions, and this is the creation of the Tetrarchy. So, in one, in one sense, Diocletian has dispensed with the republican core of the empire, the republican residue that had persisted from the year 500 
up until the year 280. But moreover, Diocletian is superseding the Senate as an institution. The idea that the Senate is intimately associated with Rome. Indeed, the Roman Senate will supersede the existence of a Western Roman Empire and become later the patrician classes of the city of Rome and the Papal States. And how does Diocletian supersede the Senate and the Republican institutions? By simply explaining how irrelevant politically the city of Rome has become. He will establish his capital city in Nicomedia with other Roman capitals in Syrium, in Milan, and later Ravenna, and Ibaracum, which is the city, modern-day city of York. So, geographically, the whole nexus of Roman power has shifted, and it shifted eastwards into the Greek-speaking territories of the empire. So, even though the Roman Empire under Constantine will shift towards Christianity, a process which is definitively confirmed by Theodosius the Great, you can see the period from the late 3rd century until the late 4th century as a period of the Christianization of the Dominate. The institutions of the Dominate are essentially absorbed into Christianity. There is a melding of the Christian religion and the institutions of the Roman Empire as originally envisaged by Diocletian. Yes, his particular uh, capital cities and the notion of clients are going to undergo a reformation. We see the permanent division of the empire into the east and the west, and the east is centred on Constantinople, the new capital as envisaged by the Emperor Constantine, strategically positioned to withstand assault and allow the emperor to target possible invasions from the Persians in the east or the Goths in the north. All of this goes to demonstrate that an imperial identity predicated on the territory of the entire Roman Empire has now superseded any particular notion of Romanitas originating from that earlier stage of the Roman Empire. The empire will become more Greekified as the economic and military power of the empire is centred in the east and the west becomes more inundated by barbarian invaders, barbarian migrants, and indeed disillusion, as we see with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. But this, to me, is where we get into various controversies regarding demarcation points. One theory regarding the end of the Roman Empire is in the year 476, when the Emperor Romulus Augustulus was pensioned off by the warlord Odovaca. Another theory is that the Roman Empire in the West died when Julius Nepos, uh, another claimant to the Western Roman Imperial Hitchip, also died. But this doesn't mean that the Dominate as an institution has failed. Indeed, we have already seen the consolidation of a new imperial identity which has eschewed all association with the Republic which has moved the centre of power outside of the city of Rome, and it has become something other. It is born of Rome, and yet it has evolved into a new identity, um, very distinct from the Roman origins, the period of the Dominate. Yet the Dominate is the only entity which can claim imperium, universal rulership, in the same way that Augustus claimed when he established the Caesarian conception of the Principate. So... The Roman territory is losing space. It is losing the provinces of Gaul, Italy, Spain, Britain, North Africa. And yet, institutionally, as an economic power, as a military power, in its institutions and its legacy, it survives in the East. And with the creation of the barbarian kingdoms in the West, um, in Italy, in Spain... In France, we see a continuation of the Roman imperial legacy, albeit recontextualized. It is no longer hard Roman power and Roman provinces that are representing the Roman cultural legacy. Instead, it is the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church influencing the barbarian rulers to come into the orbit of the Roman Empire, into the old Roman civilization. In some cases, this is very direct such as Theodoric the Great, the ruler of the Visigoths, who will at one time claim overlordship over Italy and over the Visigoths in Spain. 
a man who could perhaps claim to be a barbarian Western Roman emperor who is contending with the Eastern Roman emperors in Constantinople and yet is also a vassal to them in a technical sense. In Gaul, you see a more tangible and more long-lasting precedent which has been set. One of the last vestiges of the Western Roman Empire to fall was the Kingdom of Soissons. Soissons was conquered by a Frankish warlord called Clovis, and yet Clovis is the one who simultaneously destroys the last vestige of Western Roman power through its last rump state in Gaul, and yet he also inaugurates the idea of Christian sacred kingship, uh, which will continue really unabated until the French Revolution and would later provide the potential successor state of the claim of Roman universal headship in the West. So the dominate is existing independent of all of these things, and yet you're seeing the precedence for future Romanitas, future Roman Imperium, albeit in a very much debauched sense and divorced from any aspect of the ethnos associated with the original city, and a definite recontextualization of all of the ideas and definitely the religion which birthed the original Roman Empire. Rome here is simply a lingering impression rather than any tangible link in the West between these institutions. The last attempt to wrestle these territories and bring them back technically, formally, into the Roman Empire is with the imperial restoration of Justinian in the 6th century, a restoration which could have succeeded in establishing renewed Roman rulership over Italy, over Spain and over North Africa, were it not for renewed barbarian invasions and a horrific demographic crisis, the plague of Justinian, the devastation of Roman cities and the end of a recognisable Roman culture and the birth of a vulgar Latin or later Italian culture. Yet the dominate the institutional precedent that had been created from Diocletian up until Theodosius the Great, the man who defined the Roman Empire thereafter as being Christian, remains, albeit truncated, in the East. And this, therefore, comes to a very complicated question, because the term Byzantium has become endemic in terms of this discourse as to how to describe what Rome will later become in the East, identified with the city of Constantinople. Even though the term Byzantium is a historical invention uh, arising in Germany 100 years after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, I believe it has significant worth as a historical concept because Byzantium associates the legacy of that empire with the fate of Constantinople. But moreover, it represents a process of orientalization, making the Roman Empire exotic. In other words, making the Roman Empire something other from the city of Rome itself, the alienation of Constantinople from Rome. Because throughout the 6th century, and the 7th century, indeed, up until the 8th century, the city of Rome is directly ruled over by the representative of the Roman emperor, the Exarch of Ravenna. So, to my mind, it is a nonsense to refer to a definite period of Byzantification, the dominate becoming Byzantium during this place, because Rome is still part of the Byzantine Empire. So how can the Roman Empire have become something other? Yes, the territory is ebbing away, but the institutions of the dominate, the Christian dominate, the Graecified dominate remain and are intensifying. During the 7th century, the Roman Empire goes through a cataclysmic disaster, which is that of the Arab invasions. Roman territories, which have been there since the reign of Augustus, Syria, Egypt, and even later North Africa and Spain are conquered by the Umayyad Caliphate, which will later fracture. The territory of now what is considered a Roman Empire is now limited to parts of Italy and Sicily, parts of the Balkans with its heart, its beating heart in Anatolia in the city of Constantinople itself. But looking at the period of the entire span of Roman history, of course going back to its earlier period, 
Rome has always had an evolving sense of geography in terms of what provinces are seen as inherently Roman. Indeed, one of the themes prevalent throughout this uh, presentation here is the idea that we're talking about a Roman ethnos, Roman citizenship, the res publica, Roman identity, and the idea of the creation of a vast Roman empire being something which is other than that, being something which contradicts this idea of Roman particularism, of a distinct Roman identity, becoming instead an imperial identity, which is something which is pervasive throughout the Dominate, and will only intensify when Greek supersedes Latin as the formal language of the Roman, of the Roman institutions, but for all intents and purposes, the link to the city of Rome and to its principal figure, that of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, and its connection to Byzantium ensures that there is a vestige, a very weak vestige of Romanity throughout the institutions of the Dominate. So how do we evolve this idea of the dominate into a definitive concept of Byzantium? Well, it is the split between Rome and Byzantium, which is a process throughout the 8th century until we arrive at the year 800. Leo the Asaurian, a Roman emperor, was responsible for defeating an attempted Arab conquest of Constantinople. Afterwards, to commemorate his victory, he ironically imitates aspects of the iconoclasm of the Umayyads and begins destroying religious images which are associated with the heretical, blasphemous practice of idolatry. This opens up a major religious schism between Constantinople and Rome, with the Pope effectively ignoring the diktats of the Emperor. Now, all these, this idea of a religious contention with the emperor has existed throughout this period, but it's never been so intense as we see in the 8th century. And in terms of consolidating this process, Leo the Asaurian removes various ecclesiastical provinces, various dioceses from the direct rule of the pope. The pope has become isolated and left in Italy. And to make matters worse, the last emperor to really attempt to restore Roman imperial power, that of the Dominate, in Italy was Justinian II, Justinian II who was deposed twice, and Leo the Asaurian would essentially allow for Roman power in the first half of the 8th century to ebb and die. Here we have the arrival of the Franks, who I have mentioned with Clovis, and the precedents being set for the succession of Roman power based on a pale residue of that original Romanitas and the endurance of the ideal, the Caesarian ideal, which is being created by Augustus, that of divine kingship, which is later going to be transmitted through the Christian conception to an idea of sacred kingship, the idea of the monarch as vice-regent rather than the monarch as a literal god in the earlier Roman sense. Because during the 8th century, the Franks arrive in northern Italy, defeating the last embers of the Lombards who have attempted to conquer Rome forever. They succeed very briefly, only to be defeated as a result of the invitation and the collusion between the Pope and the Franks. When the Dominate um, is ruled for the first time by a female Emperor Irene, the Pope has a pretext to crown Charlemagne the greatest of the Frankish Carolingian rulers, as emperor of the Romans. And this, to me, is the definite state with which we have the transformation from the Dominate to Byzantium. And why? Because the Dominate, even though it represents a diminishing of Roman imperial power, yet at the same time a consolidation around Christianity and the figure of the emperor, it had a undisputed claim to Roman Imperium, the idea originally created by Augustus, and indeed the whole idea of Roman history as envisaged by Livy as that of being the glorification of Rome. All of a sudden, there are now two claimants to that legacy. Even though during the Tetrarchy, there were various client emperors and emperors in the West and emperors in the East, 
both claimed that legacy in tandem, not in opposition to one another. And the Pope here has set a precedent that Romanitas, the residue of that imperial authority, comes from the Pope and not from the institutions of the empire or from the city of Constantinople. We therefore have various competing Roman authorities now. We have the Emperor of the Romans in the form of Charlemagne. We have the Emperor of the Romans again in the form of Irene and her successors. And we have the Roman Pontiff, who is also claiming a form of universal headship. So we not only have two, but later as will be identifiable during the medieval period, we have three claims on Roman imperial universalism. And combined with the exoticism and the relocation, the nexus of power being moved away from Rome, to Constantinople, I believe 800 is the most convincing date in which one can differentiate the periods of the Dominate and the beginning of a Byzantine Empire. As for the Byzantine Empire and this, what it really represents, it represents a, a Greekification. It represents, to the Western mind, moving away from a Roman Empire and becoming that of an Empire of the Greeks. And combined to that, you have a religious schism. In addition to the language difference in the West between Latin and the East between Greek, this has resulted in a disputation in rites between the Latin rite in the Christian mass and the Greek rite in the East. With the headship of those religions, of, that, of these aspects of Christianity under the Patriarch in Constantinople and the Pope in Rome, we are seeing divided rights, divided traditions, and divided political loyalties, and increasingly divided theology, which was exposed so viscerally under Leo the Asaurian, and had much earlier precedence in the early councils of the church, and throughout the 7th century in the preceding, um, the preceding era, the Monophysite controversy on the nature of the status of Christ as being divine or not divine, etc. So it should be apparent that by the 9th century moving to the 11th century, that the East and the West are moving further and further apart, that Byzantium is representing Orientalism, is representing exoticism, is becoming more pertinent as a way to periodize this period in Roman history. If Roman history is to represent a continuity in institutions in which Byzantium obviously takes claim here, even though the power has moved away from Rome itself to become Constantinople. Roman, in terms of representing a vestige, was something very much other from Rome as it was originally conceived in the early centuries, in the later centuries BC. This will only intensify. You have the Byzantine Empire going through highs and severe lows. We see a period of consolidation, a form of um, cultural revolution and conquest, the orthodox um, assimilation of the Bulgarians, of various Slavic peoples, of the Kievan Rus into the Byzantine sphere of influence. Byzantium is representing a form of soft culture, but very much one that is localized in the East and into the Eastern Slavic regions, into the Black Sea, etc. During the Macedonian dynasty, from the 9th until the 11th centuries, we see a process of reconsolidation of the empire. Yes, it has become exotic, yes, it has become orientalized, but Byzantium is still an imperial contender, it is still a force to be reckoned with. It has not yet devolved into being a city-state like Rome was at its inception. But all of this quickly looks as if it's going to collapse with the Battle of Manzikert, the invasion, of the, uh, the invasion of the Seleuk Turks, and only by the intervention of the greatest dynasty of Byzantine emperors, the Komnenoi, is the empire able to avoid complete disaster, that and the intervention of the Crusades, which, if anything, helps to serve as an example as to how the Western Franks, with their allegiance to the Roman Pontiff and to a much lesser extent the Holy Roman Emperor, are beginning to see the Roman Imperium as encapsulated in the Emperor of Constantinople, Byzantium, as something other, which is going to result in that horrific crime against culture, 
which is the Fourth Crusade, which in itself could be seen as revenge for the pogroms of um, the Emperor Andronicus, the last of the Komnenoi emperors. So we see a division of the Roman empires, and perhaps thematically and dramatically pertinent, we see as Byzantium is created by a division between East and West. So to my mind, the fate of Byzantium is conferred uh, confirmed by the titanic crash, uh, clash and devastation incurred by the conflict between Rome and the West, papal, Catholic, um, Rome, in contrast to Rome and the East, vested in Constantinople. This, to me, represents the end of the period, the periods of the Roman Empire, beginning with the legendary period, the early, early Republican period, um, sorry, the early Roman period, the two Republican periods, the period of expansion and the period of uh, disintegration, the Pax Romana, the late Principate and the crisis of the third century, and the long period of the Dominate, which represents a significant period of transformation in the history of the Roman Empire. Byzantium as a distinct entity, in some way representing the heir, and representing itself as the heir to those various historical stages, has met with a total calamity. When we see the restoration of Constantinople to a Greek Orthodox emperor in the form of Michael VIII um, Paleologos, I cannot bring myself to look at this as a continuation of that legacy, beginning with... Um, uh, Virgil's um, Aeneid and the Kingdom of Alba Longa, bringing back to Romulus and the legendary period, so on, because it is very much a rump state which can claim only possession over the city of Constantinople. It cannot claim to even represent a monopoly of Greece, Orthodox Greece. Uh, as I mentioned before, with the Emperor Aurelian, Rome had been split into the Gallic Empire, Rome proper, and the Palmyrene Empire. Well, throughout the entire period of the Paleologus Emperor, emperors, there were contending authorities in Greece. There was this idea of the Latinocratia, or the Francocratia, the Venetian possessions, the residue of the Frankish conquest of the during the Fourth Crusade, and then there is the Emperor in Trebizond, who can also claim some aspect vestige of that Roman um, legacy. So the idea by the time of Michael VIII has become so diluted, it is simply a Greek despot, and despot of course becoming a word associated with this period, so it seems appropriate, ruling over the city of Constantinople, and little else. Any designs that the Emperor Michael VIII could have had on Italy or the reconsolidation of Greece and building back the heartland of the Empire in Anatolia were quickly undone and in less than a century the Turks would have spilled over into the Balkans and the Paleologus Empire would essentially be nothing more than a few possessions in the Morea in southern Greece and the city of Constantinople itself. Indeed, this idea is so divorced from the continuity of Roman history that there is an inclination to see the fall of Trebizond, the fall of the Komnenoi, or even the fall of the Gothic principality of Theodoro in Crimea, vassals of the Byzantine Empire, as the real fall of the Roman Empire. But this is simply nothing more than echoes of a legacy which has already long been long since been dispossessed and whilst the fall of constantinople marks a calamity for christian civilization and the onslaught of the turkish invasion into europe for the next few centuries a sense of that roman vestige or residue continues on in the west now relocated in the city of rome under the popes so I hope what I've done in this lecture is to try and contextualize all the ways that we can look at various periods in Roman history and try and identify key moments and periods of transformation, social transformation. Um, something I, again, to emphasize during the move from the Pax Romana 
um, into the crisis of the third century, for example, is the early precursor to feudalism um, and the various forms of land grant and pranoia, which are going to persist into the institutions of the dominate and the Byzantine Empire as well. All of these periods are associated with significant cultural, political, economic, and social change. You cannot look at the empire in Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire in 1204, and really feel much connection with the, the Greek Christian population uh, to that of the Roman Republic as it's really becoming, becoming to coalesce with the end of the Latin League in the year 338. So the process of periodization becomes essential and yet, because the process of periodization is something post hoc, it is so susceptible to controversy and to recontextualization um, that it is never a settled debate because periods exist clearly within history. And yet, as historiographical tools, they also exist beyond history itself in the meta as part of the mind of the historian. The mind of the historian looking at these events, trying to contextualize them and to draw definite meaning from them. An earlier video of mine from last week um, was titled Reflections of the British Empire. And many of you very thankfully left uh, positive comments on this video, uh, on that video. Uh, so I've attempted to replicate uh, that style with this video. This wasn't originally intended to be the video for this week. I had planned to uh, host a discussion on the legacy of the British Empire, but that's going to be postponed uh, for a few weeks down the line. It's still going to happen, uh, fortunately, but um, uh, not this week. Um, I I'm not sure whether this is going to become the enduring format of this channel. <laughs> um, a part of it makes me very uncomfortable, given the fact it's so... Um, it really represents a thought process, a continuing thought process, and um, one can go look back on it and talk about ways that things can be refined and embellished upon, and maybe that is a benefit of this um, process of um, identifying key points and being able to extrapolate more from them and being able to build upon them and form uh, a repository of useful historical information founded on these various trains of thought. So thank you everyone very much for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment. It helps very much with the algorithm. So thank you and goodbye.